Hi, um, my name is Dusty, um, and I created an app uh, back in 2021 called Nominal. And so uh, this is really about my experience using Bevy to make that. Um, so to go back, when I first started really the idea of uh, what I wanted to make, uh, I started back in 2009 using Haskell. So this is before, I think this is long before Rust was even a thing. Um, and so the idea was, I love Haskell. I wanted to make a 3D game, but uh, making the game I kind of wanted to make the, in 3D, just the assets, it's so much work to create just meshes. And like, so I had some experience doing it and I was like, there's no way I could do this on my own if I'm just using like conventional tools. So um, I figured, you know, whenever I hit, hit this sort of problem as a programmer, what I do is I make the computer do it for me because computers are fast and they're great at doing such things. So, and naturally I would use Haskell, my favorite programming language. And so I set off to do this and starting with um, the 3D convex hole. Um, so um, 12 years later, because this is an incredibly like a rabbit hole, uh, if you know anything about 3D geometry, um, I worked and worked and worked on this. And then I kind of just dropped it because I just knew I couldn't hit the performance target that I needed to hit to make this work. So it's like, okay, I need something else that what I have just isn't going to cut it. Maybe computers will get faster. I don't know. Um, so 12 years later, um, I'm like, I, I really want to pick this up. I think this can be something I've used rust a little bit. And I've used, I spent a lot of time using C. I'm like, I, I think I can do this. And so just like evaluating the different languages available to me. Um, one thing in particular about Rust, that if, and so in this particular odd situation, Haskell or Rust really inherits, or it seems to get a lot of uh, its trait design from Haskell, or at least it's heavily influenced by it. Um, so they're similar to Haskell's type classes. And at the scale that I was at, um, it's really important to be able to kind of copy things over, trade at a time, object at a time. It just makes it really easier to do a large port. So this is not a huge code base, but I think it's about 20,000 lines at the time. And I really just wanted to like port it directly into Rust, like functional code tested, works in Haskell. Um, and so, um, And so um, I was able to do that. It took a little while. It took three months, but the result was incredible. The performance was 20 times as fast. So I went from taking like a quarter of a second to being able to hit interactive rates on an old 10-year-old laptop. Um, so another thing that attracted me to Rust is the vibrant community, with lots of crates, and specifically, uh, a, a game engine um, that's really got a lot of a lot of people behind it. So that leads to Bevy. Um, like many people, there uh, I think there was a strong temptation to just be like, uh, "This has to be written from scratch. This is something unique. Nobody has ever done this." But I have to keep my ego in check that because I set a timeline for myself. I wanted to make something, uh, an actual game, a publishable game in two years. And I knew that if I do everything from scratch, that's just not going to happen. Uh, I'll fall into the trap of making my own engine and never getting anything done. So I looked at the big engines. I tried to be responsible. Uh, look at Unity because everybody's using Unity. It's not Rust or anything, but maybe I could cobble something together. Um, I looked at Unreal, but uh, really uh, Bevy seemed to be a great fit. Um, for what I needed. It was able to target Apple uh, because my target that I wanted to run on was an iPad. Um, and it provided much of what I needed. But um, it really lets me take it apart so that I can make it really my own engine. I can pull out the pieces I need, hack away, and get what I want. And furthermore, the community is excellent. So um, they've given me a lot of support in um, getting things to getting it to do what I needed it to do, and as well as accepted uh, PRs upstream to get to get Bevy to where it needed to be for me. Uh, so um, 
as a quick overview of like some of the, just like a quick overview of the things that I worked on in Nominal, like the particular areas. Um, this is what the interface looks like. You can see on the right, um, this is from the help. Um, we've got the big stage in the center. Uh, the bars are the shelf on the left and the stack on the bottom. The ribbon that has all the command icons um, that you can click on. Um, so the the stage is interesting and it was a lot of a lot of math because what I wanted to do was basically implement VR, like a VR type of control, but using only a 2D surface. And so to do that, I needed to unproject movements into 3D space. And uh, I found this is called uh, direct manipulation. In particular, it's 3D direct manipulation. Um, what we're used to on touch screens is 2D uh, direct manipulation. The idea being you can your movements are mirrored by things in the user interface. And so this took a lot of math and experimentation, um, but I got that working. That was kind of like the first thing to prove that this concept could work. And then I needed to implement the bars on the side. So this was interesting, particularly with Bevy, because I needed uh, multiple cameras to be able to overlay um, to overlay those so that so that like anything in the stage would not block the bars because it's not clipped at the edge of the edge of the bars. It, it, it just kind of overlay. Um, that was a lot of work um, to get multiple cameras working and also the handoff between when you move something out of a bar and back into it, it has to smoothly let the bar kind of take over control. You can't see this, unfortunately, because it's not animated, but all the um, all the models and the bars kind of slowly rotate on their own. Um, the commands, so those are the the different icons uh, on the bar. They I started with Bevy's buttons, but I ended up re replacing those with my own code. Uh, so they're basically just uh, they're, they're just images, um, and I do all the input control. Uh, another another thing, and this is will be common to any sort of editor type. So I think. Maybe this should be something that could be abstracted, but an undo redo system. My initial idea was to sort of almost implement like a um, like a version control system where you could kind of have a chain of differences and move forward and backwards on those. But I found I wasted a lot of time on that, and I found that um, it's just easier to use full snapshots and cycle through those. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of the different areas in the interface. And then um, I wanted to use uh, physics to implement constraints. So the idea being you could, as in real life, smash things together, like maybe put a wheel in place in a wheel well, and it would kind of clunk into place uh, because you wouldn't be able to overlap physical shapes. Uh, I started uh, with Rapier for that, um, implementing my own custom shape. But I found it, there was just a lot of friction with, with Rapier. Um, and it didn't it didn't have great performance. And that could have been partly my own fault because I had to implement collision. But um, it was also a lot of work to track uh, Bevy main. So every time I wanted to make a change, I wanted to follow their up, update to pull in some new feature, I would end up having to fight uh, the Bevy Rapier plugin and make a bunch of changes and essentially vendor that. And that was quite a bit of my time. So in my library in Facet, I already had collision, collision detection. So I just needed really a solver. I really wanted half of a physics engine, not an entire one. Um, and I asked to see if if I could do that with Rapier, but at the time it's it's no. Rapier runs on Perry, and there's that is what you what you need to do. So um, I wrote my own physics library. Um, using sequential impulse, and um, I call that impulse drive. And this uses Bevy ECS. So this is a, a custom designed for my use uh, physics engine, which has a lot of interesting ideas, uh, but I'm not going to go over that. Another interesting feature I implemented is uh, Z camera. So the idea is I need to give the user some sense of depth um, because scale and depth look about the same on a 2D screen. They're indistinguishable. 
So it's hard to tell if two shapes really overlap or if or not. So um, this camera gives a view from the edge of the screen uh, as if you had somebody kind of standing at the edge of the screen looking in and uh, it, it is automatically controlled. So it avoids any um, anything blocking the camera to look at what you need to see. Um, I found this feature, this is one of the features that really just kind of clicked into place. It was still a lot of work, but using things that I had written earlier, using like ray casting and asynchronous tasks, it was able to fire off a bunch of rays and figure out how to swing the camera to look at what it needed to see. Um, uh, another interesting feature that needed to be added to Bevy was the ability to render to, text render to texture. Um, this took some work. Uh, that got in, and I was able to use that to display the, this Z camera on the edge. Um, uh, so this is like this uh, a fairly small change to Bevy, but this was quite controversial. Um, changing Bevy's global transform from the same representation as transform. Uh, it's, Let's see, SRT, let's see, TRF, um, TR. So in, instead of going scale rotation and then a 3D, a th VEC3 for scale, um, it uses an affine, which is basically a three by four. It's a three by three rotational matrix plus a three dimensional offset. Um, so I, I needed that because what I realized is when uh, you can rotate shapes around and they become unaligned, like how do you align, say, a um, a torus or something like that? How do you align the ensure that those are properly aligned with a local axis? Sometimes there aren't three natural axes to a shape that you want to scale, and so you want to scale it ac across some feature that is not aligned with the axis. Um, but there's no good way to do that. So I found in this process that the current global transform was also subtly broken because there's, if you do it scale at any, at anywhere except the leaf nodes, the leaf uh, transform, it was, uh, they compose incorrectly and give the incorrect result. And so a particular example is if you scale down X by 50%, you rotate 45 degrees around Z and do it again, there's no way to represent this in what Bevy had at the time. Um, so that change was able to get in um, and it, yeah, it, it really works well now. Um, and uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, for a large project like this and in particular when you don't want to be dependent on PRs going upstream uh, to release your own product. Uh, you really need the ability to hack at Bevy, basically make whatever changes are needed to implement the features that you need on your own timeline. And so this, uh, this means um, essentially forking Bevy, um, but there's good ways and bad ways to do that. So uh, since some changes are hard to generalize and they're just never going to make it upstream, um, it's good to have a way to manage that. Um, in my case, there's few commercial users of Bevy and also a few mobile users, at least at the time. There's more now. Um, so a lot of my changes, I needed to rip out render passes because mobile GPUs are even more affected by uh, memory bandwidth requirements. And in particular, um, there was one pass, the clear pass, that uh, would simply fill an entire render target for one color, write it back out, only for it to be immediately read back in in the next pass. And this showed up clearly in the debugger. So I just ripped it out. Um, it was pretty easy using WGPU to do that. And that in particular had a huge impact on performance. And so like, I was like, all right, now I know my thing to do. So I went left and right, ripping out passes, ripped out like half of them. Who needs shadows for this particular camera? Rip it out. Uh, just pulling out passes left and right. And it easily doubled the performance. Um, and I just went with the metal debugger, looking to see where all the time was being spent and 
my first reaction was if I see something big there and I can't immediately justify it, just rip it out. And so clearly this sort of hack and slash approach would not make it upstream. Um, but it was these, the numbers that I got from this did inform later changes that would help with these issues. So things I think are a bit better now for mobile, but we'll see. Every time I, I do a update to the latest version of Bevy, I have to do a bit of this each time. Um, so given that forking Bevy is not optional, um, how do you do it? So uh, what, what I do um, is I track a set of patches. So I need to track a set of patches and I really want to upstream them. So it's good to keep them based on the latest code so I can uh, break these off into PRs and send them upstream. So I, what I do is I have two branches that I work off of. One is called upstream and one is called fix. So the names are kind of arbitrary, but fix is what I work off of. So my, my products are based on my bevy fix branch. Um, upstream is designed to track history. Basically, it, it records each merge point that I base fix off of. And so it, what I started with was just the fix, ban fix branch. And uh, what I found is I lost history. It wasn't immediately apparent until I wanted to go back and do like a, get, a get bisect and um, found that I was missing commits because they'd been garbage collected. So um, I, I actually learned this from working with another large upstream project. Um, this particular workflow is what you do is you, um, you take the fix branch and you merge, merge it into another, uh, into the upstream branch, and then you immediately revert it. So, so it records the changes, un undoes the changes, and then you take upstream and update it to the next merge point. So much later, update it, uh, basically do like a, it's, it's kind of like a, a squash merge, but that doesn't work. Um, and then re keep on rebasing fix on top of upstream. Um, the specifics on how to do this, the git commands. So I'll be able to share these slides somehow. So you got to be able to copy these. So the, um, specifically upstream branch, check that out, merge in your work that you've done in fix and then revert it and then do a restore. Um, and then do a commit. It says restore bevy to this particular hash from upstream. Um, and so this is my work stream now, and it works pretty well. Uh, I, I keep all my history. I have uh, continually rebased changes that I can pick out one by one and submit them upstream. Um, and so I, I kind of try to minimize the number of commits that I have on fix from, from upstream, but it's still around like, I think 20 or so. Uh, maybe 30. So um, the, the organization of the project itself, how I lay the files out is I use, use Git submodules for all of my first party crates and uh, vendored crates. That vendored crates are uh, outside cr third party crates that I've had to fork. Uh, those are typically anything I need to submit upstream PRs to. Um, I will vendor those so that I can submit PRs from from the uh, create the from the submodule, um, and I use Cargo Patch to override where those come from so that they can come from a local path. And uh, workspace dependencies work well to keep everything synchronized. Um, it's not good enough just to use Cargo Patch because the version numbers need to match. Uh, if your version doesn't match what um, you have in the patch, then it will just go and grab them from uh, upstream. And I've, I've also recently found that Charms soft serve. So this is a private Git server that works well over SSH. This works really well for things that are uh, proprietary that I really don't want out on GitHub or any commonly hosted system. Um, Looking forward. So what I've been working on right now, um, I had been working on debugging some problems with Facet, which is the um, geometry, the CSG library. And um, if you've done much with geometry, it's really hard to visualize 
uh, particular bugs. So I, I decided I had been using um, Blender and trying to use other apps, but I figured it was time that I just write my own viewer uh, for the custom for these particular problems. And so in the spirit of extreme overkill, I decided to use Facet to debug itself. So what you see on the screen rotating, uh, that that's not that's generated using Facet. So it actually, uh, all those shapes are unioned uh, together into a single mesh, which could be in theory is solid and should be uh, 3D printable. Um, so I, I use this to view uh, as a little debugger, but I found the bigger purpose for this this app is it's really like app number two. And I, I realized a lot of things when you move on from the first app, there's a lot of things that can be generalized that aren't obvious until you actually try to use all the technology you had from a previous app and a new one. Um, so, and what, what I'm looking to do next is uh, port Bevy to the Apple Vision Pro um, because I would really like to take Nominal into VR. Uh, that was really kind of what I wanted to do at first. And uh, I didn't think the options were there, but now with the amount of power that this new system has, it should be feasible. Um, so that's that's all I have. Um, Thank you so much, Dusty. Uh, being able to use Bevy on Apple Vision Pro, that would be so amazing. Um, Super interesting presentation, and uh, I love your app. And we have a bunch of questions, but uh, in the spirit of time, um, I would also hope uh, to uh, encourage you to stay around longer for a conversation afterwards. Uh, and I would focus on the one big question that is uh, uh, coming up. What's your experience um, using having used Rust and Haskell, and uh, what are you missing in Rust from Haskell, and how is it feasible for game development comparing it to Haskell? So um, Haskell still is quite a bit more abstract than Rust. Um, so that it's somewhat visible in porting of, of functional code to Rust. It, it works pretty well. I found a, a pattern that works really well is abusing the heck out of iterators and iterator style patterns. So what would often be a list in Haskell becomes an iterator in Rust. Um, I. I think the main weakness that I found was uh, while traits are similar to type classes, they lack a lot of the power. And in particular um, for the hierarchy, so I was able to implement monoids, but then when you get into monads and anything, uh, I think it's called higher, higher order types, um, Rust just doesn't support that yet. So um, I've also had to abuse macros a fair amount. I feel like feel like I could have done that better in Haskell. But honestly, I've kind of like been in Rust so long, it's starting to fade. I'm starting to yearn for Haskell yes, less, but uh, it, it clearly still has lots of things that it can steal. I almost see Haskell's like upstream Rust. I think that a lot of things that get stolen from Haskell and people don't even know it. Um, for instance, the I noticed uh, talk about the at match, the at what is it called? The at symbol in pattern matches. And that was clearly taken from Rust, or sorry, from Haskell. Um, mm. So just uh, Rust is feels less abstract. Um, but ha so really the biggest problem I had with Haskell was performance was a problem. Um, but the biggest problem, I think, is it it has a really, the packaging is really difficult with Haskell and portability. So to the point where Running even just running anything written in Haskell on iOS would be extremely difficult. So I found that it was I was pretty much tied to running things on the PC. And furthermore, I'm not even sure how to distribute an app on the PC written in Haskell. So it's really kind of like if you're writing server software on a ser on a PC on an x86 system, you're fine. But it, it's very mm -hmm. limiting when you want to get outside of that. So I would not choose Haskell for a game, mm. uh, even though I really wanted to. When implementing an undo redo system in Bevy, what should we be mindful of, given that you have so, some experience with that? Um, it really comes down to, at least the way I did it, serialization. Um, you need to be able to serialize and kind of like bring things back and out quickly. Um, 
So I, I guess that's it. It really comes into being able to serialize everything, the state and bring it in and uh, do that. Um, but there was also an interesting article I saw online. I don't think I've quite implemented this in nominal yet, but <clears throat> when you, so there's a way to linearize undo and redo. The idea is that you have like a redo stack and that keeps every time you get, you undo, it pushes it onto the redo stack. But um, when you want to make a change, so say you have something in that stack, the, w the way I currently do it is I just basically drop that, re that redo stack and you lose that work. But there's a way to keep that work. What you do is you essentially take that, replay it, and, and this is kind of a, more of a get way of thinking. But at least with states, it's pretty easy. You just jump, you just keep the, you push the redo stack back on, and then you jump to uh the previous state and make changes from there so that way you don't lose anything that you've done so this kind of like linearizes it's, it's essentially like uh doing a revert and get it'd be like doing a revert commit before you make any changes um, so i guess that's something okay. to consider so yeah. otherwise it can be um disconcerting for the user that they've done a bunch of work and they go back and then they make like a small, tiny change. It's almost inconceivable, like maybe change a color or something. And then bam, all that, they can't redo anymore because they can't replay the changes they made on top of that. Mm. So it, it's a surprisingly complex subject, I guess. Yeah. What made you go to this, uh, to, to use this uh, snapshot-based approach um, versus the, the yeah diffs, I guess? Uh, it, it was, it turned out that the amount of state I needed to hold on to was relatively small. And getting a uh, a change based system to work correctly, like especially if you scrub forward and backwards, um, it just makes the, it's a lot more chance for errors to propagate. Uh, mm. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of had something some some experience working on like a, a MIDI recorder also that did something similar, and I switched to a state based system just because uh, jumping around is easier when you don't have to step through all the steps in between. Mm. OK. So, uh, and uh, Dusty, this is another Haskell question. Um, because of how you su how surprised you were, do you think that Haskell community is not honest about Haskell's performance? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think. So this isn't a problem with Haskell in particular. Um, it's that. Haskell makes it hard to really reason about memory behavior. And this is like a known problem, I guess, with really functional languages in general. But contrasting it with C, I can tell you exactly which bits are going to go where. And um, because uh, uh, garbage collected languages in general tend to scatter memory across, uh, you know, across the heap, then it's really hard to optimize for memory. So I would say it's not Haskell specific, but it's garbage collection. And it's not the problem you think it is. It's not uh, the garbage collection operation, but it's the problem that you can't organize how your memory is going to be written and read. And that has become increasingly important because of disparity between memory performance and CPU performance. You really need to have an idea of what access patterns you need and be able to, uh, to lay them out properly. So this is, yeah, garbage collected languages in general. Uh, so it, ruling those out, you're stuck with, uh, well, of course, Rust, C, C++, um, anything that, that, that you have direct control over memory. And out of those, Rust is the one that, that um, can do so safely. Dusty, you talked about render to texture in your presentation. Was that a feature um, that was uh, that you contributed to Bevy? And if so, how hard was that? And how long did it take? Uh, yeah, sort of. I kind of revived it. So there had been render to texture before that in one of the examples. And it was ripped out as part of a rendering um, uh, upgrades to the rendering system. So I worked on adding that back in. Uh, it was quite a while ago, so I don't know exactly how long, but my answer is generally to get anything upstream. For me, it typically took about a month. Um, so I just kind of land on about a month for any PR, which is, I don't know, disappointing, kind of slow. Hopefully things have gotten better. I know Alice has been working hard on getting things merged quickly, and I really appreciate that. So I'd like to try upstreaming a PR again 
Uh, hopefully it'd be a quicker process, but I understand like I've worked with open source a lot. This is how things go. Um, both because of the amount of things going upstream and I could be doing better with reviewing PRs to help with that. Um, but just like the amount of discussion that really needs to happen. So I would say, yeah, yeah. If you ever are going to submit a PR, it, it kind of has to be a back burner task. Um, I get the code working on my end and that's where uh, my fork really helps out because uh, generally things don't make it in for about a month to th three months. Uh, but mm. in particular, the render to, I think that was one of the first more rendering heavy things I did. And Bevy is great about, you can just kind of dive into the code without any clue what the heck you're doing and just start hacking away. And things generally work out. I mean, like with without ha having a lot of documentation, I was able to kind of understand what's going on and make the changes I wanted. So um, it's a great code base to hack at. That's a great testament. That's cool yeah. to hear. So, uh, so kind of expanding on that answer from a maintainer's perspective, um, I, I would definitely like to get our PR latency down, especially especially in a backlog and especially for more complex stuff. We're actually doing pretty well on easy, really easy PRs, but a lot less well on tricky, complex feature PRs. Um, but unlike in like traditional software engineering, there's two different types of time to consider when you're, when you're thinking about, okay, how long does it take to do a feature or to get something upstreamed? There's how many hours are you working on this, which is, you know, maybe like five or 10 for uh, like for, for a complex feature. And then there's how many months, like how many, how many days, how many weeks, how many months of latency is there in between there? And those are both really important measures to bear in mind when you're trying to plan a project. Um, but they're very different things, and it's really easy to conflate the two. Last question to Dusty. Did you try Bevy XBBD? Uh, what SDF physics have helped you with the complex shapes? <laughs> uh, it didn't exist then. This is back in 2021 when I started. Um, I, I, I would have been, especially where it is now, I, I'm really interested in the ability to decouple um, collisions from the solver, which is exactly what I was looking for in Rivier back then. Um, so I don't know. At this point, though, I kind of have my own my own engine, and I'd kind of like to play with that just because it's fun. But which I'm sure you can understand. Um, so I, I do have some interest, some different ideas with the way I do physics versus the way that they're commonly done. Um, in particular, one that I'm particularly proud of is that I can do collisions at different rates and separate things. Uh, I can basically collide just this specific set of, of shapes and then that feeds into the solver. And that's really useful um, to cut down on the number of things that can, to uh, cut down on the number of things that are checked for collision. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I have something really customized to me at this point. And it would be interesting to kind of generalize that. But at the point I'm at, it really depends a lot on facet. So unfortunately, and I, I'm also watching the Bevy Shapes um, PRs, I guess, to see if I could integrate those into my engine just for the heck of it. But um, one thing that makes collision a lot easier for me is that I only handle one type of shape and that's um, a set of convex polyhedra. So it, it kind of, I don't have to have the N squared problem of having to handle all different types of collisions between different types of shapes. Mm -hmm. So it keeps it pretty okay. small. Yeah. But uh, would like from your understanding of SDF, uh, because that wasn't the question, would it, would it oh, right. uh, be, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, SDF. So I, I've, I'm also watching that. It's interesting. Uh, SDFs though, I think they would have strictly higher overhead than what I have. Um, so you, it really, if you could view facet as a particular type of SDF, um, but if SDF, as I understand, is typically practiced, uh, the you you kind of have to hunt around in some either regular or irregular space, looking for re it's sort of an implicit surface um, representation. And so, uh, since I can explicitly, I can use GJK um, much more quickly. I don't think I don't think SDFs would really help. I think it would have worse performance. Um, but 
Uh, I am interested because it's um, Media Molecule. What they've done with Dreams is pretty impressive. Um, but I, and I actually ended up buying that game just so I could evaluate their technology. Um, it, it, it is visible at the edges that it, it doesn't have clean edges. Uh, what, how important that is for a game is another matter. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in SDFs. I don't, I don't think that I would switch to such a thing in anywhere in the near future. Another, another thing that's interesting. Uh, so like I said, I'm looking at the Apple Vision Pro. The vision, the way Apple has, so Apple has some privacy concerns because they use gaze tracking. Um, so what they do is um, it'll track your gaze and then you it needs to have a way to highlight a particular mesh. And so they impl- that you have to use Apple's render called a render or reality kit um, to do that. And so essentially you need to be able to feed that with colliders and meshes really cutting out a lot of these um, special rendering techniques because you have to use their render. And even Unity has had to bolt their engine onto Apple's render. Um, So it kind of validates that no meshes are not. Many people claim that meshes are kind of in the past and we're going to do all ray tracing in the future. But (laughs) I've gotten a lot of mileage out of proper meshes with proper triangles that I can easily do collision detection on. Um, in the normal way. So it'll make it a lot easier to port to such more restricted systems that have a more, that still use traditional rendering. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of leery of any special rendering where SDF is also used, also often used for uh, rendering, but also um, for collision. I'm not sure. Uh, one, one concept in FACET is to keep things, to re- really focus on convexity because uh, basically all uh, linear and, and uh, log linear algorithms rely on that. And so SDFs, um, my understanding is they allow concave shapes and it, it doesn't really, there's no magic there. Once you go to concave, you're, you're stuck in N squared land. Um, so things <laughs> will fall apart. Um, okay, Dusty, yeah. that's, uh, that's a lot about SDFs. Uh, super happy to, uh, to yeah. hear that you're going to port uh, Bevy to uh, Apple Vision Pro. That would be amazing. I can't wait for that. 